Shabbat Shalom. Next week, we are celebrating, along with um, many other congregations around the country, uh, our Religious Freedom Shabbat. You'll have to come back next week for the uh, part two of today's sermon, and that invitation is, of course, open to everyone. But next week, we will talk much more about the, uh, the threats, the challenges, the, the issues within our community, our city, our country, our world, regarding religious freedom. But today, I wanted to talk a little bit more particular a little bit more about the Jewish concept. Because you may be scratching your head saying, well, wait, does Judaism believe in religious freedom? Uh, Jews may like religious freedom, but what about the actual theology of Judaism? After all, we are radical monotheists. We believe there is one God. And um, that seems, on the surface, to be at odd with pluralism, with diversity, with extending religious freedom. So let's work through that, uh, that topic and see where we end up. So first of all, let's talk about uh, Jewish concepts of religious freedom within the Jewish community. How many of you are of Ashkenazic background? That is to say, you have family that comes from uh, Western or Eastern Europe or, or what used to be called the Soviet Union. Maybe your families came from what is now Ukraine, and then it was Poland, then it was Russia. Uh, that, that the borders kept moving. We got a lot of hands. How many are you from a Sephardic background? from the, the great Latin American diaspora that uh, happened in the New World, but also spread across North Africa and Greece and Turkey and into the Middle East. I'm not sure if we have any that are inherently Mizrahi, that come from the, the ancient Jewish communities that were throughout Iraq, throughout Yemen, throughout um, Iran, uh, back when it was slightly more uh, welcoming in those times. Uh, how many of you come? not from any of those communities in particular, but have chosen to become Jewish, may have been born outside the Jewish people, but have adopted the Jewish people as your own, and we have adopted you. Well, that's quite some diversity already, right? I, we, we already recognize that there are Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardi Jews and Mizrahi Jews, and uh, we have conservative Jews, Reform Jews, and Orthodox Jews. Well, is that just because no one person has the power to force them to all be the same? Is our diversity merely a, uh, a feature of the great diaspora that's taken place over the last 2,000 years, where there is no Jewish pope, where there is no Jewish hierarchy? Uh, as it's famously said, trying to get rabbis to work together on anything is like herding cats. Um, perhaps our diversity and our acceptance of each other is mere patience, that as I uh, wait for the time when I will have the upper hand, and then I can force the Sephardim to follow my rules, or I can force the Ashkenazi to follow my rules. Well, if we look through our history, we'll actually find that that is not the case. Some of our students in our upper, upper classes uh, have recently learned uh, about Rabbi Joseph Caro, uh, who wrote uh, one of his ma many books uh, known as Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch is one of the last great law codes um, that was written in the pre-modern period. Everything gets weird once we get to modernity, as those of us living through it can attest. And this last great law code was originally written just for the Sephardic world. That is to say, Rabbi Caro was writing down, this is how we in our communities celebrate Shabbat. This is how we in our communities handle financial um, judicial decisions. This is how we in our committee, uh, sorry, our community wear a talit. But even when he was writing that, there was a special clause that he would add on many of the pages. Yesh Omrim. Yesh Omrim. There are those who say, and in context, what he was doing is he would say, this is the law, but there are some others within the Sephardic world that disagree, and they do it a little differently. That there were multiple opinions on many topics, and even writing his own book, the great summary of Jewish law, where he was trying to cut to the chase so that we'd all be able to get it right without confusion, he included confusing counter opinions because it was simply inconceivable to him that you would write a law book that wrote out large portions of the community that did things a little differently. Pluralism was there from page one. 
But wait, there's more. Because Shulchan Aruch, as we now have it, as it is imprinted in, in all modern editions, is no longer only Rabbi Karo's book. Because Moshe Israelis, the Ramah, uh, who was up in Poland, or what we would now call Poland back at this time in the 1500s, he received a copy of the Shulchan Aruch as Joseph Karo had written it for those Jews that were living around Sfat in Israel at that time. And he said, oh, this is really well done. But there are things that he says that are not what we do here in the European community. And so he wrote his own set of notes after each and every one of the paragraphs that Rabbi Karo had written, explaining whether they agreed in Ashkenaz or whether they disagreed, and if they disagreed, what they did instead. And the Ramah, this great rabbi, added, Yeshomrim, in addition to doing it the way that I think it should be done, there are others within the greater European communities that disagree, and they do it like this and like such. So you end up with two major opinions, Rabbi Karl and the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Yisraelis, having the majority of the page, but each of them include additional voices from within the broad area of their community that disagree with them. And they don't say they're wrong. They just say, this isn't how I think it should be done. But it's still worth recounting. It's still worth recording. And if in your village, in your town, in your country, in your place, you do it like that, wonderful. That's fine. Just understand that in my town, we do it differently. Everybody following the thread here. Baked into Judaism, even in a pre-modern time before we were contaminated by modern ideas of liberalism, individualism, and freedom, even pre to all of those ideas as a formal political doctrine, Judaism was already embracing and enshrining a plurality of opinions and diversity, religious freedom within the Jewish community. Now, of course, within a community itself, they did still need to agree on certain things. Uh, we don't want to have a debate every time we've served services of uh, exactly which prayers we're doing. So we do tend to uh, adhere together with a, a shared idea. But if someone said, you know what, Rabbi, I disagree with the way that you are conducting this part of the service, I would say, great. You can have a synagogue of your own someday. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. I wouldn't say, heresy, sinner. And I certainly wouldn't drag them outside and uh, start throwing rocks at them. Because that is not a, an idea within Jewish practice. All right, so within the Jewish world, there is an inherent concept of Jewish diversity, of Jewish religious freedom, of understanding that, yes, as a community, we need to work together. But as individuals there, and as, as, as separate communities, there is great room for variety and diversity, and something that we have thrived from, especially now in the 21st century when many of those dispersed communities have reconnected in ways that we never imagined before and shared much of that wisdom. Uh, it is an incredibly rich time to be alive and be Jewish and an incredibly diverse time. But maybe that diversity, maybe that pluralism, maybe that religious latitude is only for Jews. I mean, after all, we have the Torah, we have the God. Maybe in Judaism, we don't think other people deserve the same amount of religious freedom. After all, you go back through the Bible, and uh, I do recommend doing that from time to time, and you'll find some interesting stories. For example, the story of Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, who is uh, of such great fame and has often recounted his tales. Uh, one of the most famous incidents, of course, is the battle at Mount Carmel. Now, this wasn't a battle with uh, swords and shields. This was a battle over whose God was right. You see, the northern kingdom, after a civil war in Israel, had at this point, under Ahav and, and uh, Jezebel, gone to Baal worship. Baal was one of the uh, Canaanite deities of the time. And Elijah was not terribly fond of them, that they had chosen to worship these idols. Um, and he said, look, you're Israelites. You are from the people that God has asked to follow Torah, to, to worship him in this way. And now you are worshiping these idols. But you're also still saying that you are worshiping God. We need to find a way to solve this. So I propose a showdown. We'll build two enormous altars, and we'll each have a cow. But neither group, neither the Baal prophets nor me, 
will set fire to our altars. We will let whosoever God better set fire to the altar. And so they set it up, and the priests of Baal get to go first because Elijah is so gracious, and they are screaming, they gash themselves with knives, hoping to convince their God of their blood, and it goes on and on for this for hours, and nothing, of course, happens. Baal walks up, he soaks everything in water, because he was a, uh, sorry, Elijah walks up, he soaks everything in water because he is the master of making a point, and he says, God, the people need to be reminded. Fire, everything goes up, everyone goes, whoa, God's great, and the Baalites are pushed off the mountain, metaphorically and a little physically. But then by the next day, everybody is back in line under the king and queen, and Elijah's running for his life. But that failure to actually change public policy aside, was Elijah saying there is no room for other religions? Was he saying that you're not allowed to worship as you wish? Uh, okay, maybe we might want to give some room for him to criticize his fellow Israelites, but there were non-Jews as well that were worshipers of Baal. Was it wrong for him to say that their religion was illegitimate, that it was false? Well, the short of the answer is yes and no. I know, the perfectly balanced conservative rabbi answer, yes and no. So first of all, let's start off with the no aspect. Just to get this out of the way. No, he was not saying that in and of itself. He was not saying all religions except for Judaism are illegitimate. What he was saying was that this particular expression, this Baal practice, is a problem. It is, in fact, a danger. Not just a danger to, to God and to the Israelites, but a danger to even non-Jews who were practicing that faith. Idolatry in the ancient world was an insidious evil. It corrupted the individual and it corrupted the state. And when we see the behavior of Jezebel and Ahav, her husband, the king, we see this over and over and over again, that they are among the worst of the kings and queens of the Jewish record. Uh, well, not that Jezebel was technically Jewish, but that's a whole nother line of the uh, discussion. But there's a reason why Herman Melville named the sea captain Ahab, which is the English version of Ahab, and why the word Jezebel has come down into English as a slur. So there was something about Baalism in particular that Elijah and God was upset with. But it wasn't just that it was different. In Judaism, we have a concept that the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come. The righteous of all nations. We don't say you have to be Jewish. We don't go around proselytizing and forcing other people to be Jewish at, at sword point, like many other faiths have done throughout history. Instead, we say, look, if you want to be Jewish, we are more than happy to welcome you into our midst, and you can join us and become Jewish in every way. But if you don't want to be Jewish, be a good person. And if you're a good person, hareze meshubach, that is wonderful, as uh, Ramah would often say in Shulchan Aruch. Be wonderful, don't be a Jew, but be a wonderful good person. Doesn't mean you have to worship our way. It doesn't mean you have to believe in our God the way we believe in our God. However, on the opposite side, it does mean you have to be a good person. And you can't hide behind the mantle of, it's my religion, while behaving like a monster. You want to join into the molech practice of passing your children through fire? Of sacrificing a child? Well, no. <laughs> It, I'm not upset at your religion, I'm not upset that you're not me, but I am upset that you are harming children. And as such, even if it's part of your religious practice, I will say, no, you don't get to do that. That there are certain thresholds that if you cross, I will try to stop you. If you claim that you have the right to dominate others, to take over their country, to, to force them to uh, obey your rules because it's your religion, my religion, my God, loves when I conquer. Maybe God is Thor, and Thor likes a good fight. Tough, says Judaism. I'm not going to say that you can't be different than me, but I will say that you're not allowed to do that. You do not have the right to define good and evil according to those rules. 
Now, that means that we're not exactly fully in the progressive, open sense. But I would be willing to wager that most of people who call themselves open and progressive and liberal also would draw a hard line at these behaviors. That there are certain behaviors that are done in the name of a religion that are not acceptable within the human family. And that is not the opposite of religious freedom. That is actually standing up for the rights of all humans to find their way to God without fear, without intimidation, without exploitation, without oppression. Because as we know from the original story of the formation of our people when we left Egypt, our first request to Pharaoh, the simplest thing we asked for was not let us be free and no longer slaves, it was let us worship. Let us celebrate our God our way. And Pharaoh, of course, said no. That is not religious freedom. Just because for Pharaoh's religion, the idea that we should be allowed to be free and to worship our God our way was opposed, that his religion forbade our religion, doesn't mean his religious freedom protects his right to, to oppress us. Are we following the logic here? Judaism says you have 100% of religious freedom up until the point where you stop me from having mine up and until the point where you harm someone else. Then your religious freedom is null and void, and we're going to drag you to the top of Mount Carmel, and we're going to have a little talk. And we're going to see what's legitimate and what's not. And if you think that what you're doing, you're, the pain that you are inflicting is legitimate, then we're going to have probably more than just words. That's not trying to take away your religious freedom. That is trying to take away the power that you are using to abuse others. Judaism has had a long time of being powerless, and so we have gotten very good at noticing the abuses of power. And now that we have a little bit more freedom, we are very careful to make sure that we, too, do not slip into the habit of trying to use that power corrosively. But it means that we also now have a few more tools at our disposal to speak up, not from a place of powerlessness like we were for many thousands of years, but from a place of stability, and thank God in this country, equality, to be able to say, I don't think so. That's not your faith. That's a flaw. Your faith I will protect. The right of you to worship as you wish in any way, shape, or form that does no harm to any other. I will stand and protect you, and I hope that you will protect us. Harming someone else in the name of your faith, I'm pretty sure that Whatever God you are claiming is giving you that permission, never did. We will talk more about some of those problems, some of those uh, issues facing our community, our country, and the broader world situation next week when we continue our discussion about religious freedom. Until then, be good. That's all we ask. Shabbat Shalom.